Hello everyone, it's a long one. Susan Wojcicki is the CEO of YouTube, has been since 2014, and she's done a lot of stuff in her career, and she's done a lot of stuff on the YouTube platform, and I want to talk about many different things with her. And when her people got in touch and said, would you like to interview Susan? I thought for a moment and didn't respond immediately because I wasn't 100% sure I did want to. Um, I sometimes feel that the more I know about the internal workings at a company, the, the harder it is for me to get sort of like properly incensed, you know, to the extent that I sometimes need to, to, to get things done and to, to, to shout the right words in the right direction. But I've already had several conversations with Susan, though certainly none that are as long or involved as the one I'm about to show you that we had over Google Hangout. But I do want to put this in, in the proper context, and, and that being that I'm a YouTuber, I have a business that is based on YouTube, and that is important here for two reasons. One, because I do like this platform, and because I, I have a lot of my self-worth in this platform, and because of that I know a lot about this platform, and I know a lot about the good that it can do, and I have a lot of pro-YouTube bias, basically. And that's just sort of an affinity for the platform. And on top of that, I also know that Susan is one of the most important people in my world, possibly one of the most important people in the world. And I don't think that if, like, I'm mean to her, she's gonna turn the views off on all my YouTube channels or anything. But I do know that, like, this isn't a bridge I want to burn, this is a good person to be on the right side of, like, and subconsciously, not like, at every moment this isn't a present thought in my head, but subconsciously I know that every time I ask her a question. So I'm not like intimidated by her authority here, but I am informed by that reality. And I wanted to be honest about that up front. Now, I don't think that it affected my judgment or what questions I asked or how I asked them. And I don't think that it prevented me from getting heated in the moments that I got heated. But we're living in this world, and so I think it's important in moments like this, when we're talking to powerful people, that we recognize all of the different inputs that might be going into how we are communicating kidding and what questions we're asking them and etc. And those are my caveats. Uh, this is a long conversation so I'm going to put the questions I asked in the description with links to the timestamps in which they occur so you can check out the questions you are most interested in. Or of course you could just watch the whole thing which I think is completely worth doing. Everyone here is my interview with Susan. Hey everybody this is Susan Wojcicki. She's the CEO of YouTube. She's been at Google for a long time. Uh, 15 years plus now? 20 years plus. Oh, okay, yeah. So sort of the whole, not the whole time, but close to the whole time. So first, let's just let it, get this out of the way. How is quarantine? It's tough. I think yeah. for all of us, we are doing what we can to get through it day by day. You know, I mean, there's certainly nice things about being at home, but the environment around us, of course, and reading the news has been so sad. And, and it's just, it's a mm -hmm. disruption for everyone. So... Uh, for us at, at YouTube, really the focus was making sure we could continue to offer all the services and keep all of our employees mm -hmm. safe. What, what are the parts of the business that are hardest to do and have been hardest to train to function from an at-home environment? Probably the biggest challenge in terms of work from home was there were two areas, probably the people who work with hardware that need to test on different machines sure. and equipment. Yeah. And the second one was people who do some of the really sensitive reviews, so our content reviewers. They don't necessarily want to be reviewing some of the more, what we call egregious content in their homes. And so we had mm. to work on ways to be able to accommodate those reviewers. Do you do any, have you been doing any uh, communications with the staff to make everybody feel like you're, uh, you're sort of on the same page and they, they sort of know where YouTube is headed right now? Yes, definitely. We've continued all of our regular meetings. So yeah. we do a company-wide meeting with all of our different offices around the world. And we usually do that weekly, and we've continued that. And we've actually seen a lot of people have been calling in and engaging that way so they know what's happening. And in some ways, there's a big benefit to that, which is that we can bring on all kinds of speakers from all over the world and different locations. YouTube obviously is a big influential uh cultural institution at this point um you know a lot of people get news and information through youtube a lot of people get it's a place for distraction it's a place for entertainment it's a place for education on on sort of a top level what do you feel like is youtube's role 
uh, in the midst of this crisis? Well, we immediately felt that we played an important role in getting out valuable health information. And you know, yeah. one t- if YouTube does one thing really well, it's getting the word out to our global audience of <laughs> over 2 billion users. And just the scale that we operate, we know that we can do that effectively. So we immediately ba- began engaging with all the different local health organizations and reaching out and getting the messages in their language and what was appropriate for each of the different countries and mm-hmm. putting that information in our home feed, uh, also making sure that if you typed coronavirus, COVID-19, or there were videos associated with coronavirus on that topic, that we were showing mm-hmm. links to different authoritative health organizations. And we, we have right. served billions and billions of impressions. Um, every day I look, it's it's like a billion more health-related impressions. Uh, the second thing that we did is we saw that we needed a lot of news information. And so we have a breaking news shelf that triggers in about 30 different countries when something mm-hmm. important happens in the world. And we made that a pretty much a permanent part of our page so that users could always see what was happening with COVID-19 every single day. And then the third thing is we ran a big campaign to encourage and and remind people that staying home saves lives. And so um, we engage a lot of creators. So thank you to all the creators who created public service messages with that. Mm -hmm. And we created um, some of our own campaign associated with that. And I think last, just helping people connect. We see that there's so many people who are at home, they're unable to do their regular activities, whether it's go to their religious organizations or connect with their school or go to concerts. Mm-hmm. And so we're always working to figure out how to help people connect. You know, there's a there's a lot of value there for sure. I, we also know that like we live in an age of information and also of misinformation. One, it's it's difficult to know when you're talking with a like there are there are credible sources and there are mainstream sources and those things aren't always like perfectly overlapped. Like we've seen some mainstream news organizations that significantly for seemingly, I would say political reasons downplayed the crisis early. Whereas you might have some people like Dr. Mike who are like, you know, just a guy, but like a credible one who's taking his role as a science communicator and health communicator seriously. He's not a, he's not a mainstream news source, but he is a credible one. Um, so balancing that, figuring out like, you know, how we identify credible pieces of information and what we elevate and what we don't, like it is not a simple problem and it does not seem to be a problem that necessarily can be done anyway, but but carefully and thoughtfully and manually and slowly. And slow is really hard on the internet, especially when something very fast is happening in the world. Yes, so definitely COVID-19 took us all by surprise, just the speed that it moved. And we had to take incredibly fast actions as well. But when we look at misinformation, we were able to leverage the work that we've done over the last couple of years. And so that has been a huge area of focus for us. And we've built a large number of tools and systems and ranking to be able to handle concerns associated with misinformation. One of them is is having policies around misinformation and removing content if it violates the policies that we have. And we've had to make a number of policy updates associated with COVID-19. The Mm -hmm. second one is raising authoritative information associated with it. Uh, And we have a variety of ways of ranking that information. We work with Google on some of that ranking. Um, And then the third is... is, um, uh, making sure that if there is content that we see as as lower, sort of borderline to our policies, that that's mm-hmm. something that is um, less likely to show up in any of the recommendations for our users. So like when I'm looking for information on YouTube, whenever I'm watching anything that has anything to do with COVID-19, there'll be a little thing on the bottom that's like, and this is also true of like moon videos. Sure. That's like author- more authoritative information under the video. And I think that that like that's going to grab a certain percentage of the populace who, you know, might be like like aware of credibility and that there are credible pieces of information. But the but there is the part where it's like we need to interrupt these people's path down the rabbit hole. And there is the part where it's like we also need to understand what's leading them down the rabbit hole. Do you feel like YouTube has any, um, you know, you sort of have an uh, an outsized ability, certainly the amount of information you have and like how much you understand mm-hmm. your recommendation algorithms are aware of how people interact with content. Is there a way for you to understand better the cycles of disinformation and mm-hmm. how to interrupt them both from a, like from a from a platform per- 
platform perspective, but also from a societal perspective? Mm -hmm. So the information panels that you talked about, which are if you watch a video around coronavirus, we have an information panel below and it will link to different sources Mm -hmm. like Wikipedia or Encyclopedia Britannica or CDC or World Health Organization or the, the local health equivalent. And Mm -hmm. so that's what you were referencing there. And I would say that that's just one of many solutions that we have in terms of handling misinformation. So Mm -hmm. I'll give some specific examples with regard to the topics that I just um, mentioned. So the first would be uh, removing content that would be a violation of our policy. That's one way to interrupt the cycle Mm -hmm. of misinformation. So recently, for example, there were a number of conspiracies associated with 5G, that coronavirus Mm -hmm. was not a virus, that the symptoms were coming from 5G, and we saw people actually attacking cell towers and destroying property because they really believed that coronavirus Mm -hmm. was caused by 5G. That is something that we made a violation of our policy saying that the symptoms are not coming from a virus or coming from something other than a virus. Um, right, and so that's, we're- that's detrimental to public health specifically. Like this is something that people, like this information could harm the health of people could kill people. Sure, definitely. Yeah. So that would be an example of a, of a policy that we had to put in place really quickly recently because that was an emerging conspiracy theory. From the mm-hmm. very, very beginning, I would say, you know, I don't remember if it was early, if it was January or, or February, but we put into place very early any cut of that, anything that was unsubstantiated medical um, recommendation mm-hmm. to cure COVID-19 also became a violation of our policy because we didn't want people to say, hey, buy my miracle oils uh, Mm -hmm. and you will cure yourself from COVID-19. And so that that's another way that we use policy and remove to be able to interrupt that cycle. I mean, that's interesting. Like at the same time, there are there are all kinds of things that are like, you know, your cancer could be cured by this thing or your like your heart disease or lung disease. You know, the it's not like you know, homeopathy or weird medical treatments haven't been around forever. Mm -hmm. And like those things are on YouTube. But specifically for COVID-19, it feels like this is a crisis now. Yes. But there's also, you know, like I think to some extent a misunderstanding of medicine and and there's always a crisis around false medical information. And that stuff has been and and like there's always been egregious stuff that has been really clear. Mm -hmm. But there's also things that like, is this part of a religious practice or is Mm -hmm. this part of like sort of a spiritual understanding and like crystal healing and that kind of stuff? Like at what point is is it like Gwyneth Paltrow and at what point is it like 5G cell towers and like where's the line between those things? Yeah, so we did treat COVID-19 because it was a pandemic. We took it much more seriously in the sense that we said right away anything that was medically unsubstantiated um, or any kind of miracle cures would be a violation Mm -hmm. of our policy. Um, and so we did that early on and you're right, like, um, that, that's a stricter line than we have generally for, for health, but, Mm -hmm. but we also use ranking. So if you type in COVID-19, we want to make sure that the recommendations that you hear are, and the videos that you see come from authoritative Mm -hmm. sources. That's another way that we handle it is to make sure that that information comes, um, comes up correctly. I think a lot of these, you know, 5G conspiracy videos got in the realm of hundreds of thousands or even millions of views. Like how how do you how do you identify these emerging things? Is there a team on on at YouTube who's sort of like focused on that kind of stuff? Yes, we have an intelligence team uh, and they look and they study. (laughs) They study (laughs) all the different trends of what's happening on the Internet um, and they Mm -hmm. happen really fast and we make sure that we are understanding those trends and we're finding them. And if something mm-hmm. we think could be harmful, we certainly check in with the experts in that area and find ways to take the appropriate next steps. I agree that these are the right steps, but it, it also just seems like this is so much power for an organization to have. Figuring out where like, where the, where the line is, like, the, and that that is the job of a private company and that that is the job like ultimately of a very few people at sort of the top of the private company. Um, to sort of establish those those procedures, at least, not certainly make calls on each individual piece of content, but to make the call on what the procedures are going to be. Mm-hmm. It is just a very big and powerful institution, and it is a lot of responsibility to have sort of collected in one in one mm-hmm. place. And mm-hmm. I and like, as much as like I I agree with the decisions you're making, like I can, I also worry that it sort of like feeds into the conspiracy mindset for one organization to have mm-hmm. that level of influence. Well, we definitely see that it's a pretty competitive landscape. That's what we see from our perspective. And okay. you you look yeah. at 
I mean, just to give some examples, we've seen Facebook being very aggressive in video, um, not just on Mm -hmm. the Facebook properties, but Instagram, for example. Uh, We also see emerging players like TikTok um, that's new, that's just uh, come out of really nowhere. Well, it came out of Musical.ly. Mm -hmm. Uh, Certainly Amazon has Twitch. Um, which we mm-hmm. know they're certainly tr- expanding into uh, trying to expand into other areas. Um, Apple mm-hmm. is coming out with a new service. We have Quibi yeah. from J- Jeffrey Katzenberg. So <laughs> it's, this is a, I mean, we see this yeah. in very competitive space and there are many opportunities for people to uh, to have their content distributed. Yeah, interesting that, th- that like a lot of those things you just named, not all of them, but a lot of them really are focused on content that they control very carefully what's on the platform. And it's not like anybody's out there being like, well, why, won't the, why can't I upload my conspiracy theory video? to Netflix. It's like, well, that's not the, the model. And it's like, well, why can't I, well, why Twitch, won't New York Times carry, carry my... TikTok. Yeah. There are a lot of user, right. other user generated Yeah, platforms. but, it, but it, is all, it is also interesting just generally in terms of, of the sort of business landscape that um, there is, you know, your business, it is an open platform and there is a lot of value to that. It is, it is also a can of worms and it's a, it's a harder, I feel like it is a harder business to run. But at the same time, like the opportunities to to feature new voices, to to gather new audiences, to uh, have people create small businesses, like is way way outpaced on YouTube compared to any of those other platforms. Um, and you know, Facebook is similar in, in that it like allows for a lot of smaller businesses to grow. And that we don't necessarily put that into our calculus, but like I do because I run one of those small businesses. The sort of definitely the new competitor on the landscape though is TikTok, and and I'm interested if you have any. Um, things that you uh, sort of admire or or like lessons you are learning from TikTok? Mm. I mean, I would say mobile creation is probably the, mm-hmm. the key thing. And if you, you know, you as a YouTuber um, probably do a lot of creation that's not on mobile, probably with mm-hmm. more so, um, upstream, um, higher quality. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. That kind of uh, big, yeah. big cameras, video cameras. And so definitely the mobile creation is an area that makes sense and brought down the ease of creation. And, and we, of course, have mobile tools, but but certainly the way they've developed them, I think, has been com- definitely has been compelling for users. When I mean, obviously, when a new player comes onto the landscape, you start to see how that product is being used. Mm -hmm. Um, And is that influencing any product decisions or strategies at YouTube right now? I mean, we're always looking at the competitive landscape. And that's a good thing about competition inspires all of us in different ways. So we're always looking at the landscape, always figuring out what makes sense for us to do based on Mm -hmm. what's happening in the space. And I I think that happens both ways. People look at what we're doing and get ideas and we look at what sure. others are doing. And, and again, yeah. that's why that's why that's the benefit of having so many different players. Are there any other companies that you, you sort of have your eye on that are inspiring YouTube strategy at the moment? We definitely watch all the different players the, out there. All We're the, seeing, all the ones I have I'd every expect. subscription, for example. <laughs> um, I have mi- okay. lots of every music subscription, every yeah. uh, video sub subscription. Uh, mm-hmm. And then I, I also watch what's your, what... what's your what's your monthly subscription budget in the in the Wojcicki household? <laughs> I don't know. It's probably too much. Um, yeah. But but yeah, I mean, I feel like I need to do that for my job. Um, and I yeah. need to test them yeah, on iOS course. and Android. So. Yep. Um, <laughs> do you do you have a Quibi subscription? Uh, yeah, I I do. Oh, okay. Yeah, I like. All right. Yeah. Boom. Have you enjoyed it? Yeah, I mean, I think they've also had some really nice innovations with how they do creation and um, Mm -hmm. they've tried to innovate again in mobile um, short form Mm -hmm. and different views, whether horizontal or vertical landscape. Every new player brings something different and that's what makes this a really dynamic space. If you ask me, the real competitive advantage of YouTube is its economic ecosystem that that it evolved for creators. And that was an early decision and it was a thing that happened way, way early on YouTube and, and the fact that, you know, the majority of advertising revenue that runs on my videos comes to me is not how other uh, creation platforms on the internet works. We don't really talk about that that much, but it is it is definitely a thing that is very different on YouTube. Um, do I'm you glad. know? I'm glad you what? highlight. I'm glad to see you highlight that because we agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you know how many uh, sort of like the idea of how many people are making five to six figures on YouTube right now? Uh, we don't release that, but we have released in the past a growth rate of that. Mm-hmm. I want to say it's it's had approximately a 40% growth rate. So overall, we have definitely seen... Like year, like this year over last year? 
Yeah, when we looked at that, um, I mean, of course, everything changes with COVID. So I can't say I've looked at it in the last couple months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, we see good growth. It's a real income. People accept it as a career and people are employing a lot of jobs. And that's something we really try to emphasize, especially with policymakers, is that YouTube is a platform for small businesses and every creator Mm -hmm. behind every creator are more jobs. A lot of them have like you, right, have Mm -hmm. um, merchandise or books. Yeah. And I and like it is important to to note a couple of things there. I mean, I've sort of like started to realize that in some ways, because my business is so reliant on and, and based on YouTube historically, but also like even how we imagine our future, you know, we in some ways operate inside of YouTube the same way that we operate inside of Missoula, Montana. Like the, these are just different business landscapes and like they are almost like the, our our feeling about YouTube is is almost physical. Like it is a reliance and it is it is almost like you are our government and when your policy changes, it affects our business and um, and it, it's a little bit like we pay you a tax, um, but like you know, you provide services in exchange for that tax, just just like government. Reframing in that, that way in my head has been, has been a bit of a trip because of how, like, ultimately, uh, I also don't get to vote uh, for who w- the decisions that are made and, and who is in charge. But like, there are ways to influence that. Um, and I think one thing to note is that like creators in YouTube ultimately have a lot of the same goals, which is why, if you think that you know YouTube hates creators, you know you just have to ask like, okay if like the number of people making five to six figures has increased 40%, like that's good for YouTube as well as for creators because that, you know, we have to pay our taxes. Well, we always say creators are the heart of YouTube. And yeah, we yeah, well, yeah, there's no platform without us. Yes, like, I, I mean, like, they make YouTube unique, and we recognize that, and, and yeah. we do everything we can to right. create the best environment we can for creators. We recognize we don't always get it right, but we really are trying to do mm-hmm. everything we can. Without there being sort of a direct voting relationship, there are also ways that I think that creators know and should know that they can influence the platform. And and I'm curious. Uh, from your perspective, sort of what are the what are the ways that have been most effective for creators to to get your attention to um, to to change policy to you know make like help you know what you need to be focusing on for from their perspective? Uh, well, you know we we look at creator feedback in many different ways. I'd say we definitely look at it uh, quantitatively. You know, as a company run with a lot of people focused on data and measurement, mm-hmm. um, we certainly measure what's happening on our platform. So how are creators growing? How many new creators do we have? Uh, Where where do we see the growth? What features Mm -hmm. are they using? So we spend a lot of time understanding what creators are doing and and release a a large number uh, of experiments to understand how to do our basic job better, um, to offer Mm -hmm. a more compelling service for creators. Um, But then we also also listen qualitatively. So what are the what are they saying to us on Twitter? What are we hearing in our creator meetings that we have? So either um, UX studies or creator summits or what are the creators saying to their partner managers? We try to always interpret it and understand what can we do best um, and how can we do better. But Mm -hmm. a lot of times it's just a it's a complicated ecosystem because we have our viewers. What do our viewers want? We have our advertisers, our creators. And how do those three constituents interact? Mm -hmm. Isn't always um, sometimes sometimes they're at odds with each other and Mm -hmm. we are doing our best to grow the overall platform and do what's best for all of the constituents in the long term. But there are definitely moments that it gets a little bumpy. Can you talk a little bit about those stakeholders? Like who are, you know, any business, the first thing you want to do is stakeholder analysis. What, who are the uh, the groups that are, you know, taking up the most real estate in your mind? I'll start with creators because creators are, are <laughs> we say, are the heart of YouTube. And they yeah. really are what make YouTube unique. And we recognize that and and want to make sure we're always well, talking about yeah i mean and that's such creators. a that's such a subjective statement but i also want to say that like they are, are also what makes youtube a lot of money and like we should say that because like ultimate like i know that that's like i don't want to be heartless about this or anything but like if we ignore that then it becomes it's a little bit wishy-washy and it's a little bit like well do you really care but if we do actually make you lots of money which we do then you definitely care about us because like ultimately it, we are we are all running companies here so i think like we're the heart of youtube i agree you care about us a lot i agree but also like this is a, a financial thing as well and like creators aren't just 
what make YouTube special, they are also part of YouTube's bottom line. Yes. So, but, but, uh, yes. So yeah. creators are important. Um, yes. From yeah. a business, For all the YouTube reasons. is a business. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is a business at the end of the day and we need to pay our expenses. Um, also yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm not saying that you, I'm not saying it shouldn't be a business. It absolutely should be. And like, I think that we should have like a good trusting, understanding relationship and understand where we're all like, where, where we sit on, on, you know, in that, like, we both provide value to each other. Yes, we, we both, pro- definitely, we both provide value. So, um, so creators are a key part. So I will say in terms of um, the overall viewership of our users, there's creators, there's music companies, and then there's traditional mm-hmm. media. I'd say those are the three constituents that make um, up. Tell me, the, tell me the pie chart. Give me the pie chart. Right. That's the pie chart. And I'd say creators but are what, about what's half the of pers- it. Okay. Creators okay. Are about well, oh, that's huge. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's, I mean, obviously, like there's a lot of us, but yeah, that's, I mean, yeah, both, and, both and it that is wonderful. And country and market and user and yeah, everything. Yeah, of course. But in general, that's a, that's sort of a good benchmark to use, at least half of it. And so, yeah. um, so that's, and I mean, that's our core that's business. A bi- it's a big deal. It's also like kind of scary because like, um, you know, if you have, if you're running a business and you're like working with the record labels and there's basically three people you have to have to talk to versus creators, which isn't like one monolithic group. You've got, you know, you got kids creators and beauty and gaming and you got people who are making edgy stuff and people who are making educational stuff and trying to make every single one of those groups happy while also balancing these other stakeholders. It's like the the most fractured stakeholder has to be a creator community. Like you have no control over it, over how it grows, over what it is and that's well, that's a that's a balancing <laughs> act, and I'm sure that it. Uh, and I know, and I know, I'm not sure. I know yeah. that it has created lots of tension over the years. Sure, sure, yes. I mean, creators are the probably the most influential voices on the internet, and yeah. so we know that if we do something they don't like, uh, we're definitely going to hear about <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, I think we're that, that like we prepared for it. Yeah, um, yeah, but yeah. I mean, we are we we have a deep appreciation for. Uh, mm-hmm creators yeah. and, and and the challenges that they go through. And then I'd say the other constituent are advertisers. And mm-hmm. advertisers, of course, are the ones that pay the bills in a lot of ways. They're the ones who mm-hmm. are generating the revenue for us at YouTube. And we want to make sure that advertisers are successful on the platform too, um, mm-hmm. of course. And we see many different kinds of advertisers, whether they're brand advertisers, like trying to just raise awareness of their product or actual what we call direct response, meaning they're trying to actually sell a specific good or get a specific action. And um, and and we realize that sometimes there's tension between the creators and the advertisers. And of course, mm-hmm. um, demonetization, brand safety, brand suitability, all these different mm-hmm. tough topics have had to do with trying to manage challenges yeah. between these two different communities. I think one thing that creators don't understand well enough is just that advertisers can leave easily. Advertisers also have lots of options and they can go to all different types of media companies. And um, they can, they're way more organized than we are. Like, you know, creators can do some organization, but advertisers, you know, it's not that big of a world. Advertisers are, if, if they don't in like where of, their content runs, of, yeah. They'll just yeah. take it. They'll just, they just they'll go. just leave, yeah. and they'll be they'll yeah. say, "Well, we were spending this money, but we're done. We're not. We're taking our money somewhere mm-hmm. else." Um, and advertisers, of course, are always afraid that the CEO or that the board will say, "Why did you run this campaign in this place? Mm-hmm. Why were you associated with these other yeah. uh, topics they might or not that be weren't the appropriate for a brand?" Yeah, I think the creator community sometimes doesn't understand some of the fragility with the advertisers, and mm-hmm. we've been working really, really hard to bring back all of our advertisers after brand safety and make sure they feel confident and keep spending. In general, I think we've been really successful in bringing them back and bringing tools. And yep. um, and, and I recognize that some that from the advertiser side, it still doesn't feel, it's still, um, there's still a lot of frustration around that. I yeah. recognize that and we, uh, and we recognize we need to continue to do more and we will. Yeah, I mean, to what extent, uh... It, it, our advertisers just running out of other options because you know a lot of people are watching content more now in places where there aren't ads at all. Um, so like younger people, for example, are are you know they're either on Netflix or they're playing video games or they're on social media. So like you might be getting them with Instagram ads, so that's good. But you're but like in terms of like a like a pre roll mid roll kind of ad format, there just isn't. There isn't a lot of space for it if you want to reach somebody under the age of 35 anymore. So do they even have options? Like like how much can you hold 
hold that over them. They do have options. I mean, I wish, I wish it was as you describe it. And and uh, there are many options. First of all, they could run on Instagram or Facebook or uh, Amazon's mm-hmm. Twitch. Um, mm-hmm. They certainly can run. I mean, again, TikTok's now also ad supported. They always can Peacock, uh, Hulu. Um, mm-hmm. Those are all ad supported platforms. And then, of course, there's the. But they don't have the kind of network. they don't have the kind of impressions that you do. They, you, I mean, YouTube I, serving I, up YouTube more impressions than those part. places. It, we are an important yeah. part of the ecosystem, but they, they also can dial up and dial down spend. That's the other thing. Yeah, they can, not spend. They, yeah. We never get we never get a hundred percent of their spend. We always are getting a fraction of their spend. And sure. part of what we saw with brand um, safety is that sometimes advertisers came back, but they were spending less than they had been spending beforehand, or they were spending in a more restricted way. And so, Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I agree that we're an important part of, of advertisers and reaching certainly, um, core demos, like, uh, Mm -hmm. I don't know, um, 13 to, to 39. But on the other hand, like, um, it is very competitive. Um, and yeah. like, we'll see advertisers continue to take their spend in other places. And I mean, influencer marketing um, is another area that we see advertisers engaging in more. I think that's, that's mm-hmm. you know, so these are all areas that we're watching. More specifically to this moment, um, I did a little Twitter survey and found that CPMs were down at about 20% on average. This is very unscientific. Um, just from people who are following me on Twitter, from our channels, some of them are down 10%, some of them are down 50% since the start of sort of the of, of the pandemic. The can you help me first understand a little bit of like the mechanics? Like how does that happen? Why does that happen? Well, first of all, I just want to say up front that I have to be very careful about what I say because as you know, we're a public company and anything about financials yep. is very sensitive. For, let me just make a few points about it and say, mm-hmm. of course, I can't share as much as I would like to, but mm-hmm. um I'll I'll start maybe just with the basic mechanics of how this works, given I'm not sure everyone in the industry or viewers know what CPMs are. Um, but sure. basically, basically, the way it works, of course, is you have your total revenue divided by the number of views. Um, mm-hmm. And then we multiply by a 1000, actually, because it, it it, otherwise, it's like number. a fraction of a cent. Yeah. Um, and so I saw your survey, actually, on Twitter. And um, and so people reported what, what the different CPMs that they were seeing were, right? Whether it was $2 per thousand views or $4 per thousand views. I mean, there was a broad range and, and there can mm-hmm. be a broad range depending upon the content that people have. Yeah. And, and also where they make content. Uh, it's very important to always remember that people who make content in different languages get very different CPMs. Definitely. And- that changes the landscape a lot from those places. Definitely. And where their viewers are, right? Even yeah. if they all do it in English, but the English is being seen in um, India, yeah, for America. example, that's yeah. kind of a different CPM than um, US viewers. So yeah. so that's generally h- how it works. And so, you know, um, two different things could influence it. A, if, you know, depending upon if you have more advertising and the same number of views, then you're going to have your CPMs go up, go up. right? Because yeah. your numerator goes up. Um, you also could have your denominator go up. So you could have a lot more views with the same amount of advertising. Um, mm-hmm. And then that would also cause your CPMs to go down, even though the advertising mm-hmm. was the same. Mm-hmm. Um, or you could have your total advertising go down and your views go up. So there are many different scenarios, right, in terms of how yeah. the mechanics of this work. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I will just emphasize, though, uh, and you mentioned this beforehand, but YouTube and, and creators are partners. Uh, we have every incentive to do what's right for mm-hmm. the platform. Um, there are no yeah, I don't changes think anybody's that mad are made. At YouTube right now that CPMs are down. Like I think it's clear that both of those numbers have changed. There are more views, and there w- the guess is that there are also fewer advertisers, just because like movies aren't a thing, sports isn't a thing, and so like even if those two things move out of the ecosystem, then there's less advertising. And one one thing that we've seen is uh, that that. Patreon and uh, other audience support has been a lot less fickle than advertising um, at our company anyway. We haven't seen, we've seen some drop, uh, of course, and like totally understand that some people need to make financial decisions in a moment in their life when it's uh, hard times. Overall, that's that's dropped way less fast than advertising. And who knows, who knows like the, the exact mechanics of that. 
But this is obviously, YouTube has been making moves in that direction um, to try and figure out how to f have ways of monetizing content that aren't, uh, are not advertising or direct advertising. And, and we've also seen that our, you know, the percentage of our income coming from YouTube premium has gone up in the last month as well. Is YouTube gonna continue moving into that direction for to have other funding models that are external to just the straight sort of auction-based CPM advertisee pre-roll things? Yes. Yes, okay, we good. are. That's great news. Yes, we are. Let me uh, encourage yes, you to are. do that and as yes, much we, as you can. We started it already. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure, as you know, and you, you engage with a lot of those products. So we definitely understand that there are different dynamics between advertising and, and these other products like um, memberships, um, super chat, super stickers, merchandise, mm -hmm. ticketing. Um, these are all different ways that we've worked to diversify revenue for our creators. And we mm -hmm. believe they're really important. And of course, the subscription revenue too, right? That comes from YouTube Music and YouTube Premium. So, mm -hmm. so we are definitely investing a lot there and we will continue to invest. And, um, but I will just say it, it takes time and energy and advertising yeah. is an incredibly, people forget how big advertising is. I mean, TV advertising is hundreds of billions of dollars um, and mm -hmm. it's switching right now. And so if you look at traditional media, about half of that, uh, half of that income came from advertising. The other half came from subscription. I think it was you know, just under 300 billion. Um, so mm -hmm. you look at that and that's all moving to different online services, whereas there was never necessarily a market for subs for, uh, like super chat before. And that's a new market that we're creating, mm -hmm. um, yeah. as well as the membership market. And, so we'll continue to invest across the board. And we be believe the diversification is really important for our creators and mm -hmm. the stability is important. We're seeing that certainly, you know, you mentioned that right now. So we'll continue to invest there. Oh, I also meant to stay, say back in a stakeholder chat um, that you, you did, you, I, I don't want to crit. I don't want to criticize, but you always got to okay. say your employees, you always got to count your employees as one of your stakeholders. So I, I also want to shout out to all the people who work at YouTube, um, who make who make the product. And uh, thank you. There's a lot of people there who are doing that thing. Um, and then I also was Definitely. curious if you sort of consider society to be a stakeholder overall, just because of the, the size of the influence of the platform. Well, we've started to believe a lot more or put a lot more attention into policymakers and making sure that policymakers understand because they have started to take a lot of interest and create a lot of policies associated with the internet and, and certainly with YouTube as well. And so mm -hmm. what really woke us up was the Article 13. I mean, of course, we always had a policy team. We had already been spending a huge amount of time on it. But the fact mm -hmm. that there was policy created that literally could have shut down a large number of creators in Europe um, mm -hmm. and affected creators globally in terms of their views in Europe, like that was mm -hmm. a huge wake up call for us in terms of just the h amount of time that we needed to spend going forward with policymakers, um, investing in our own policy team, making sure that they understand the benefits that YouTube is creating jobs, creating content, that content is being mm -hmm. exported, like all the things that all the things that policymakers want, YouTube is doing, creating cultural moments, um, new businesses, mm -hmm. small businesses, um, educational content, um, huge benefits. And we found that a lot of policymakers didn't fully understand the benefits. And so that's for the last uh, year and a half, I've been really, really focused on reaching out to policymakers so they understand. Yeah, I mean, that that is definitely a piece of it and understanding how uh, how policy affects y'all. Um, the I, I am also curious, like how much time, I don't know, I, like how much time you are able to invest in thinking about YouTube's overall sort of impact on society. And, and like, obviously there are really, really big positives to that and there are also negatives to it. Yeah, well, my job is to increase the positives and <laughs> reduce the negatives. Um, well, I mean, yeah, that's part part of your job. Like, I yeah. mean, obviously, like your job isn't to make it, it isn't just to make society better. Um, you know, your job is also to make the YouTube platform better and more successful and competitive and all that stuff. Yeah, but I I think they go together. I don't see a lot of tension between the two. Right. I don't. I know we never. They don't. They don't seem to be in conflict with each other. Uh, yeah. And and. You know, I see, I mean, I see so many benefits that YouTube has created. And certainly now during this COVID-19 crisis, I see just so many, even, you know, so many ways that it has changed right. and improved people's I mean, lives. 
Yeah, you mentioned that edu- education earlier, and I, I like I'm curious because I think that we're going to have to rethink some of maybe not how K through 12 works in the U.S., but I think that higher education is going to have a bit of a a bit of a moment where it has to figure itself out again. Um, and I I wonder how much like obviously there's you know YouTube has learning products, Google has learning products. It's what I do for a living, so it's something that I'm very curious about, and and you know. I very much want to get through and and figure out where we're going to land but um the like how how much are y'all thinking about that right now and what what role YouTube can play in maybe not just like direct immediate response but also in the next couple of years when we might be seeing higher education work differently um sort of rethink its value proposition well we do see people engaging in educational content across the board with YouTube and yeah. uh we see that we that our users are very focused on what I would call on demand learning, um, where users say, "I want to learn something right now." Like something in my house is broken. I want to learn an instrument. I want to learn a language. I want to like mm. research this one historical right. event, and they go to YouTube, and it's mm-hmm. there instantly available. It's like we're a library mm-hmm. on demand, video library on demand. And when you think about it, most people are in school for you know through high school um, in some people not even in, in the developing world, some people not even through high school. Um, mm-hmm. And some people are, you know, if they're going to college, you know, even that there's another four years. And so most of our lives are actually not spent in an educational institution. And so sure. I see the value that YouTube is creating is the ability for people to be to be lifelong learners and to be learning throughout their life, whatever they want. Mm-hmm. And we have all this incredible content. It's basically free. They can do it in their uh, free time. And especially now, there's so much reskilling that needs to happen, ways people are learning new abilities. And so we have you know, people always come up and tell me what they learned on YouTube. That's wherever I go. I always hear some story, whether they learned a language, um, they fixed something. Um, everybody has sure. a story of what they learned on YouTube. And and that's an area for us to continue to to grow. And I, I think, you know, the difference between us and higher um, institutions is we don't provide tests, right? We don't like validate that that yes. learning. We don't issue degrees. So we're more like a resource in, in the sense that we're a library where we supplement a lot of those classes. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I've seen, we've seen like a lot of institutions put some of their best content online. Um, I mean, we just like Harvard, for example, has a whole bunch of classes that they have online. They have their, mm-hmm. so you can take the same CS class that Harvard students take. You can take it online. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Anyone can have access to it. Um, they don't get the degree. Um, they don't take mm-hmm. the test, but they still have access to that content. Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the question. Like, will we be seeing more, more companies and platforms getting into like, Thinking about how you build a platform that might be specifically integrating with education. And I know that you got the the learning playlists product, which does that a little bit. I mean, I I, I think that it is not a terrible idea. If, and I'm not saying that it's like, I think it's the best thing, the best outcome. But I think that like it, there's an opportunity here for some large tech company to partner with some large high like like good brand university to find a way to help people learn for like less expensively it is just yeah. it is too expensive um it got too expensive and it i don't see an, a reason why it needs to be as expensive as it is i don't see yeah. a reason why the average person is coming out of college with twenty five thousand dollars in loans and that number only goes up and up and up yeah um and and when if we're like gonna head into a world where people are going to want to go back to school because they don't want to be in the job market, but they're not going to want to spend $20,000 a year doing it. Somebody, it feels like somebody will be making moves in this space. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think Google is, you know, it has the, it has a good brand for it at least. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a, it's a definitely, uh, especially after COVID-19, we've seen that people can do a lot more remote learning than we previously mm-hmm. thought. Um, yeah. I just saw there are over 1.5 billion kids out of school right now, um, and not all of them, but certainly people are trying as much as possible to do digital learning. The, mm-hmm. the features, I mean, I've definitely thought about it more. The features that we don't have is we don't offer, again, 
um, the ex- people really learn when they're doing the exercises. Um, so we don't grade homework. Sure. We don't give tests. Mm-hmm. I mean, we don't do degrees. And I'm not really sure YouTube should be doing any of those. Yeah, those I'm not features. saying that it should be, it should yeah, be like YouTube University, but like like figuring out how to interface with learning institutions, with educational institutions yeah. um, and, and providing more tools for them. And I, yeah. don't, I don't know what it looks like either. Um, so once upon a time, YouTube gave a ton of money to creators. Uh, mostly it gave that money to Hollywood production companies, but some creators got some of that money. It was called the YouTube Original Programming Grant. It's how I started my company. Phil DeFranco started his company. Rhett and Link got that money. The Fine Brothers got that money. So a lot of people uh, who are established with mm-hmm. with like, you know, good sized small businesses uh, arose through that program. I think right now, like some people are asking like, okay, well, if YouTube is kind of my government and I'm kind of getting a stimulus from the federal government, is there a place for some kind of YouTube creator stimulus? Uh, I think that that would be great. I don't know how much money you guys are sitting on, but um, but I think that it it's a time to say like, look, maybe some maybe some people are suddenly out of work and they're going to create things that are really interesting and and and, you know, build that ecosystem that YouTube has always been famous for. Is there like why why was that only done once? Is my first question, and the second question is: Is there is there space to do that now? Is this a good moment to try it again? Well, the reason it was only done once is because while there were a lot of successes, there were also a lot of failures. I will and I will s- tell you, Susan Wojcicki, that the successes were the creators, and the failures were the Hollywood production companies. <laughs> and there is learning that you can take from that, but it's not. Don't do it again. <laughs> well, uh, I think ac- across the board. Um, you know, we found that, yes, we're definitely investing in, in our creators. And we do find that there are many people who are producing now on YouTube. Um, and so when we do do grants, we don't necessarily give them to someone who has not been on YouTube, right? So you think yeah. about our YouTube original program, that's based that what you're talking about in many ways has morphed into our YouTube original program, where mm-hmm. we are looking at creators who already have a platform and an audience on YouTube and saying, what's the best way to work with them and help them take their content in a new direction or, you know, maybe do a movie or do work with Mm -hmm. creators I never worked with before. Uh, The focus that we have is investing in creators who are already on our platform that are successful there. Like, I don't think you would like if I said, oh, we have this big fund and we're going to go out and we're going to give it to people who aren't even on creator when there's so many successful creators already on YouTube. So that's right. That's basically But but I think that there is space for the people who are, you know, there's a there's a potential for a, a large middle class of of YouTubers uh, to up their game and and you know YouTube original programming is going lar- largely to people who are you know five million plus subscribers um, who are like you know it's trying to invest in the places that are you know showing a lot of success already. The question is whether there is there is room for smaller grants uh, and for people to like not make a particular show but like you. Like a thing that you own and that you control and that like is your style and is not about like trying to make something that maybe looks like TV. I've always been of the opinion that we, that YouTube should lean into what YouTube is. Um, and we, and we, ag- we agree with that. <laughs> we might not agree on exactly what YouTube is. Uh, shocker. Not that anyone does. And so like to, to try and find people who may be really interested in, in growing a business instead of growing like one show um, that's going to last for a season and then go away. So that's like that's much more interesting to me if you, is if you can find a way to to plug into to some creators who are ambitious and let them employ, you know, 20 people for the next 20 years uh, making something rather than, you know, employing 200 people for the for the next six months. Um, yeah. So, I mean, our focus basically are on creators who are um, on the platform that are doing well, successful. And in a sense, we already have a program where we have a lot more um, we've certainly grown a lot since that program, which I think we did, I don't know, mm-hmm. 2012. I think it was before you. Yeah, it definitely was. I yeah. think it was two years. Mm-hmm. I joined at the beginning of 2014, so I'm yeah. kind of putting it around 2012. So yeah. I, I I mean, definitely we've grown a lot. So creators who are getting started, the ability to generate revenue quickly if they have a lot of views. And we see some creators who get started on the platform um, and in a short time are able to be very successful. So we're still seeing lots yeah. of um, creators who can break into YouTube relatively quickly, have success, they're able to generate more revenue um, that Mm -hmm. way than they could have certainly in 2012. Um, And so that's basically why we're not doing a program like that. But we are trying to invest in our creators and that's that's our original program. And we're trying to do that Mm -hmm. with our top creators as a way of um, enhancing what we do on the platform and also rewarding creators for being on our platform. 
YouTube is a uh, is is part of Alphabet. Um, mm-hmm. Are there are there bad parts? Do you think to that? <laughs> Running YouTube, we don't really interact with other Alphabet companies. There's not a lot in common, for example, with like the driverless cars or Verily. <laughs> so we 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 work very closely with all the other constituents at, at Google. Yeah. Um, and so a c- couple of key ways we work with Google is certainly all of our advertising, the way it's sold and created is run okay. by teams that do that across all of Google. Um, and then infrastructure that we run on is Google infrastructure. Um, and so there are a lot of benefits there. You know, we talked about news and ranking, for example. So we work with Google search team on, on different ways that they do ranking and we benefit from some of the work that they do. So mm-hmm. there, there definitely are a lot of benefits of being part of Google, but yeah, it's a bigger company and there are times that people run into each other. And um, I mean, that happens at any big company, but uh, you know, in many ways for me, having been there for a long time, I feel like I know everybody and, you know, usually just call people up and find a way to mm-hmm. make it work in the end. So yeah, there, yeah. there are pros and cons, but lots of pros. I, I can't emphasize enough uh, some yeah. of the benefits we get. Do you think there is a space for, um, for some kind of subscription product that is similar to what we have now, but is maybe more focused on creators rather than a broader ecosystem, because you know we think about these, you know, this this pie chart, mm-hmm. um, and like I, you know, music obviously is a big piece of that pie chart, but it is also a very fraught, complicated mm-hmm. world that has its own, you know, music subscription systems. Yeah, um, and it it doesn't necessarily feel like my video viewing stuff needs to have that plugged into it. And I know that yeah. there are costs associated with having music be part of that. Um, I've always hoped and wanted for there to be some kind of some kind of subscription product that that is more directly focused on on video content and on mm-hmm. on creators. Mm-hmm. Well, what would you put in it? I would put in it all of the content that isn't music, Susan. <laughs> But but have Any, which features you're saying? Oh, are you um, saying so, background so, and yeah. offline for non-music content? Is that what, is that what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, it's basically basically the idea is like YouTube Premium, um, but uh, and, and like it could YouTube it could take many features. different forms. What you're saying? YouTube Premium features, but on non-music. Yeah, but yeah, but on everything that isn't music. Um, yeah. And the reason for that being the, the costs associated with with putting music yes. inside of that platform. I think one reason why YouTube Premium hasn't grown as fast as it could is because of the cost. I yeah. think that if it, it and and then the other piece of it is that for the cost, um, creators don't see a huge bump in revenue. Yeah. And if I think that if creators saw that this was like, you know, twenty five. 30% of their revenue, people would get much, and like it was it was clearly and and like transparently increasing their bottom line, yeah. creators would do a lot of work to market your product for yeah. you. And we are, you know, one of the best marketing forces in the world. But because it doesn't affect the bottom line that much, um, that has not encouraged creators to push it. Yeah, we've definitely looked at that. Um, and I, I think you're right there. I know it's a complicated benefits. product. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are. We've been. We've definitely looked at it. I think one of the challenges is is separating music and non music. We we've tried doing that uh, before, mm-hmm. and it's not that obvious um, what that means. No, I know. Yeah, um, I hear you. And in fact, we created this product a while ago called Music Key. Um, that was like our first version of a music subscription service. And it was not a success. Uh, that's why no one mm-hmm. has heard of Music Key. Um, and that yeah. was basically music and non-music mixed up together. Um, um, so it is it is hard. Like people use music in their background, in content. Mm-hmm. Um, you have things like clips from Frozen. Is that music? Um, mm-hmm. Is that non-music? So I, I, I just want to say we have looked at that. There are some complexities. Um, and I definitely, I mean, mm-hmm. I agree with you that there are some benefits and, and we have looked at it. And maybe that's the most I can say. But I agree that there, there are some reasons to look, continue to look, keep looking into it. You know, it's complicated if you say like, hey, you're not going to get advertising on this content. And then you get an ad and you're like, why did that happen? And it's like, well, because for these four seconds in this video, there's a Willie Nelson song and they claimed it. So, it was very hard to explain to users what music and non-music means. And 
Mm-hmm. Um, I, we, I mean, basically, we don't think users can f- can fully understand that that you get no ads, <laughs> right? On like, the, like every every on user music. on the platform. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I, I think that cre- like you could uh, you could explain it to creators, but I think that like there's just a lot of users on this platform. It is a point of frustration for me, though. Susan, thank you so much for having this conversation with me. I, we covered a ton of ground. There's a lot to go over. It's a big responsibility. It's a big company, um, and uh, and you know. I really appreciate you taking the time and I know that you probably have plenty of other stuff to be doing right now. We enjoy Thank seeing you, all Susan. your great work. Thank you for having me on your channel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. Thanks to Susan for taking the time to chat with me about uh, all these things. I'm going to go ahead and just watch this video over again now because I need to spend time trying to figure out where I, I stand on all of it, how I imagine it. And, uh, and I think that it, It is uh, a good thing for those of us who can to spend a lot of time thinking about how these platforms affect society, affect us, um, and affect other people. Everything from misinformation to um, small business development. I think there's a lot here. And I am thankful that there are folks out there who will watch this video, even if you don't make YouTube videos, just because like, we have to be citizens of the world, citizens of our country, and also citizens of this internet, because we live here now. It happened. It's too late to change it.